In the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, there is an incredible story. I'm going to ask as we move into this text today that you allow me the freedom to just share the first part of the story for a moment. Oftentimes, you know, we've read the Bible. We do read our Bible. And we know the end of the story, and we act like the people walking through that, uh, they knew the end of the story before the story came to the end, and they did not. Daniel didn't know for sure what those lions was going to do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't know for sure. I mean, after, after the story got over, they knew. When David let that stone out of that sling and it started flying toward Goliath, you know, he didn't know. So pretend with me for a moment that the account we're about to read is going to end where we end it. Are you ready? In 1 Kings chapter 17, we will begin at verse 8. The Lord is speaking to Elijah. Then the word came to him, and it said, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow, widow there to provide for you. So he rose, and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, there was a widow. She was gathering sticks. And he called out to her, and he said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I might drink. And as she was going, he called back out to her, and he said, Hey, while you're bringing me a cup of water, could you bring me a morsel of bread in your hand as well? The first words out of her mouth. As the Lord your God lives. I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm out here today and I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go take that little mill and that little oil and prepare it for myself and my son. That we will eat it, watch this, and die. Sounds desperate to me. Today I'm going to be bringing you a word entitled, God's Word in the Day of Desperation. Would you just lift up your hands and just acknowledge that in your spirit, in your mind, and in your soul, everyone here and everyone watching the live stream of this message, listen, God has assigned that you hear this word. Please don't allow anything to prohibit this word from going deep into your heart. Now, God, anoint energize, bring life to the speaker and the hearer of your word. And for that, we give you the praise and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Lighthouse, let's give the Lord one more incredible shout of praise. Would you do that? Hallelujah. As you are seated, I was reminded a few weeks ago that one of our members said to me, uh, they had a family uh, member from, uh, you know, call them and say, uh, what did your pastor preach about today? And, and that person has never come to church, and that person doesn't know about our ministry, and, but they know their family member comes here. And so uh, I think the answer was um, he spoke on Jesus, he spoke on victory, he spoke on breakthrough, he preached about hope, and... What was surprising was on the other end of the line, the question came, you mean he did not preach about the virus? And you know, as this thing has uh, kind of...
kind of taken a stronghold in our world, I determined early on that when you come to church and when you hear me preach, I don't need to talk a lot about that because you get virused out every day of your life, do you not? What I've come to declare is it doesn't matter what the name of it is, God hath also highly exalted Jesus, Philippians 2.9, and gave Jesus the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus every tongue should confess and every knee should bow that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I come to be the voice of faith and hope in the time of desperation. Are you glad about that? I don't need to remind you that these are desperate times. I don't need to remind you of the dire situation that we all have been forced into. You all hear words like frustrated and bewildered and perplexed and angry and concerned and afraid and disappointed and discouraged, upset, hurt. Words like weary, confused, um, dismayed, exhausted, and anxious. Those are words that have gripped the hearts of a lot of people. The reality is we are all ready. We are all at the point where we are looking for some good news. Come on, somebody. If you want good news, you are in the right place. Because I come to preach the word of the Lord, which is the gospel, which is the good news. I'm not going to give you bad news today. You have your fill of that. I come to declare to you the word of the Lord, that he has given you a word in this time of desperation. I got a question for you. Are you ready to receive it? The word desperation means to surrender to hopelessness. It means to surrender to despair. God's word is filled with people that went through a time of desperation. One day the king was walking and he saw two women and they were fighting amongst themselves. And they were very incensed and infuriated. And the king said, ladies, what is going on? And one had a child, and one was empty-handed. It was a time of famine and severe starvation and desperation. And the woman without a child said this, Me and her made a pact that yesterday that we would say, We will boil my son and eat him today, and tomorrow we're going to boil your son and eat him. Well, yesterday... We boiled my son. Now we think, you know, this is a Bible story, but you got to think about this. Cannibalism gripped them. They were so hungry and so desperate. And we boiled my child. Mm. And we ate him. Now today comes and she refuses to throw her son in the pot. That's desperate. Come on, somebody. Think about the man, 38 years at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus came to the pool for 38 years. No one would put him in during the, watering, the waters being troubled. And he said, Lord, I have no one to put me into this pool, and I remain lame. Think about that woman with the issue of blood for 12 years losing blood. And she was so desperate. She had spent all she had. She went to every physician. Think about the desperation that gripped her life. And she said, I have no money. I have no hope. But I heard Jesus is passing by. I will go. And if I could touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. Think of Elisha's servant looking out over the mountain, and all he sees is the enemy surrounding him everywhere, 360 degrees of the enemy. They are waging war against him. And he goes into Elisha's cave, and he says, Master, everywhere I go, everywhere I look, all I see is the enemy. And he cried out, Alas, Master, how shall we do it? Think about David at Ziklag when the enemy took all his wives, all the wives and all the children of the men, 
and they burnt the city. And his own men pointed the finger at blame at him. And they began to want to stone David, the one that was their hero just a few minutes ago, now became their uh, point of hate and disdain. I'm talking about desperate situation. Think about Job. Everything he had, the wealthiest man in the east, was taken, his children, his houses, his livestock, his livelihood, his very wife says, just go ahead and curse that God you're serving and die. And now boils have attacked his body. He's sitting there with a piece of stone scraping the boils off. I'm talking about desperate people in desperate situations. When you get desperate, you become reduced to somebody you never thought you would be. You would think things you never thought you would think. You would say things you never thought you would say. Desperation gets a stronghold over your life. Are you with me this morning? People were desperate, desperate, desperate. This story that we read today is an account of such a case. A woman who is a nameless widow, and she was desperate. Her life was sad. It was lonely. It was in despair. In a word, it was hopeless. The story goes that God would raise up a great prophet named Elijah. His first assignment was to go and announce to King Ahab that there would be drought and famine on the earth for three and a half years. When he made that announcement to Ahab, God set Elijah by the brook Sereth. And he began to sustain him at that brook every day in the morning and the evening. God would send a raven with meat in his mouth and it would feed Elijah. He was sustained by the plan of God. Then one day... God spoke to Elijah as the brook was drying up, and he said, now you're going to get up, you're going to pack your stuff, and you're going to go to a town called Zarephath. Now God said, I have assigned and I have appointed a widow there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this connection with you and that widow, and she will sustain you. She will take care of you. Now, can you imagine how excited Elijah became? He's walking toward this little town called Zarephath. His mind begins to think, oh, I praise God for that raven who fed me. I'm so glad for those morsels of meat and that cool stream while it was still flowing. God, I thank you. And God, I'm not being ungrateful, but man, I am sure glad I'm going to have a change of menu. Amen, somebody. I'm going to go to this very wealthy widow that you have all made the connection for me, God. And it's going to be like the Hilton. I mean, I'm going to have this plush, beautiful, thick robe to wear. I'm going to have a warm shower with four or five selections of shampoo and conditioner. Come on, somebody. I mean, you know you're in a fine hotel when you go to the shower and there's those things sitting there. I don't have a lot of hair, but I just use so much of that. Da, 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 da. I just put it in my hand. It just runs down. If you don't have much hair, you know what shampoo does. It just runs. And I shampoo, and it's just awesome. And then I'm going to have beautiful thick towels. She's going to have a, a small... Um, a little refrigerator there, and it's going to have all the stuff in there. What's those little refrigerators called? What'd you say? A mini fridge. For those of you that are watching at home, people are still smarting off when they come to church. And I'll go on record, I love it. And it's going to have a mini fridge with one of those $6 Snickers bars that she's going to pay for. Come on, somebody. And I'm just going to I'm just going to be living high on the hog. I mean, I cannot wait to find this wealthy widow that's going to take care of me. And furthermore, she's going to find out how awesome I am, what a great prophet I am. She's going to take her checkbook out. Come on. And she's going to begin to write me a big check for my ministry, underwrite my work. And I am just so excited to meet this wealthy, awesome, strong, powerful, influential widow. Mm -hmm. So he walks into town, and he doesn't see that type of woman. What he sees is a very frail, gaunt, broken down, beat down, hungry, tired, thirsty, hopeless, little widow. 
God says, that's her. And Elijah says, like some of you sometimes when God speaks to you, excuse me, God. I know, I know that's not what you, I, I, under, I, I think there was a breakdown. I, I don't think we're getting clear reception today. Let me move to the better air. Can you hear me now, God? Because I thought you said that little broke down, beat down, weary, hopeless woman, that's the one that you have chosen to take care of me? Excuse me, God. God, do you really know my condition? God, are you sure you want to double check your facts and you want to get back to me? I'm going to give you a little time, God. Get back to me because I'm sure that you're kind of, there's been a little uh, miscommunication here. Oh, you said that. Come on. And so he said, that's the woman. So in verse 12, we read these words. As she said, as the Lord lives, your God, I will, I have not a cake. Elisha heard her say, I have just a little meal and a little, a little oil, and I'm going to gather these two sticks that I might dress it for me and my son that I might eat it and die. I want you to take a moment and listen to her heartbreak. Listen to her complete and utter despair. It is what you hear if you take time and you listen to all the news and all the reports. If you make that decision, you're going to be inundated with fear, anxiety, hopelessness, and despair. Anybody give me an amen about that. Despair set in on her, and I want to make a couple observations. Number one, she was suffering at no fault of her own. She did not choose this predicament. Understand this. Well, we are all walking through. No one chose this. We sat here a year ago, and we were oblivious to how the next year would look. We did not know um, what, what 2020 would bring. No one chose the predicament that we are in. No one chose these circumstances. She was suffering at no fault of her own. She was being made a victim by something that was bigger than her. Are you hearing me this morning? And she was just under the circumstances in the throes of the terrible ordeal that had dealt her life, and now here she is. She was in pain. She was uh, uh, broken. She was in despair, and she didn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. Second thing I want you to note about her, is she was doing the very best with what she had to work with. I mean, it wasn't like she was just sitting around feeling sorry for herself. She was industrious. She was hardworking. She was out gathering sticks. She was out in a situation trying to do the very best she could. She had run into a dead end, and she had no other solution. I want to preach to people here this morning. I want to listen to everybody that's hearing me. It is time that the people of God understand that when you run out of options, God still hasn't. When you think you've reached the end of your rope, God is just getting started. He is the God of the impossible. And here's the reality. She did not deserve that. Secondly, she was doing the best she could. And thirdly, she didn't see a way out. There was no solution. She, she could not see past her pain. And some of you know what it's like to hurt so bad to live in such despair and darkness, that voice is so loud and the voice of pain and despair is so all-consuming that you absolutely don't think there is any way out. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. Everyone that has ever fought off suicidal thoughts, you know what I'm talking about. It is, I don't have any hope at all. It's not that things are bad. I just cannot see my way out. She had heard no doubt about other poor widows that they had taken their last meal and their last oil. They made their last cake. And they gathered their children around, and they all ate, and then they sat there till each other died. Now watch this. She did not have hope. It's called the time of despair. 
There are people in this world and there are people right now listening to this pastor. And you almost got your hand on the panic button. You are almost going to make a decision. Number four, the decision she made was dictated to her by fear. And every time you make a decision based on the voice of fear, it is not the voice of God. God says, do not be afraid. The Lord is a light of your salvation. Whom shall I fear? The fear of man brings a snare. You can use caution, you can use discretion, and you can use wisdom. But make sure that every choice you make, every decision you make, is not based on the fact that you are afraid and that there is no hope. We are people of hope, somebody shout amen. We belong to God and he has created hope within us. She suffered at no fault of her own. No one signs up for that. She was doing the best she could. She saw no way out of her condition. She made her decisions based on the dictates of fear. Let me give you another one. Here is what I come by to tell you. She figured God in the equation, at, not at all. She made no room for God. It was like, yes, I know there's a God. I acknowledge your Lord God as your Lord God lives. There is, there is this word come out of her mouth. She says, yeah, your Lord God is living, and I understand that. But even as he lives, I have no hope whatsoever. And she did not ever get the thought in her mind that I could call on that God, and he could help me. Come on, somebody. He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. How many times, honey, have we said in a constant situation with a couple that was married and they would talk 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour and a half, and they, all they would do is talk about the problem and not one time did they manage to figure God in the conversation. Let me tell you something. We don't put God in when everything else fails. We put God in before everything else. Come on, somebody. We know that God is able. So many times people write God out of the answer. They write God out of the equation. Twelve spies went into the land and ten spies returned and with a negative report and discouraged their brothers. And they say, yes, the land flows with milk and honey, and here's the fruit thereof. But there are giants in the land, and we are grasshoppers in our own sight. They made no mention of God. I'm not going to be one of those pastors in one of those churches when all we do is gather around and we commiserate how bad we've got it. That is not what God has called us to do. What God has called us to do is praise Him, for He's the hope, He's the answer, He's the solution. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're dealing with in your health. I don't know what you're dealing with in your relationships and in your home and your work and your family. You may be out of work. You may be jobless. You may be broken. You may be in despair, but I want you to know Know that there is a God in heaven and he is on the throne and he is seated way up high and Jesus is interceding for you and as long as there is life there is hope somebody take a praise break with me and would you give the Lord a shout of praise somebody jump to your feet and make him glad this is huge number six she put a period where God just put a coma, comma. A comma is just a mark in a sentence. You know, there are a lot of reasons to lose faith and hope if you do that. If you read the Word of God and you just put a period there, I'm going to give you several scriptures, and I'm just going to put a period at the end of those texts. Listen closely. We are hard-pressed on every side, period. We are perplexed. We're persecuted, period. We're struck down, period. Weeping lasts for the night, period. In this world, you have trouble, period. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, explanation point. The enemy will come in like a flood, period. The wages of sin is death. 
We are killed all the day long. That is why there's so much hopelessness, because he is the author, he's the author, and the finisher of our faith, and we take the pen out of the hand of the author, and we erase where he put a comma, and we just end it right there. But that's not how these texts end. I want you to listen to these texts. We are hard-pressed, comma, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, comma, but not in despair. We are persecuted, comma, but not abandoned. We are struck down, comma, but not destroyed. Weeping lasts for the night, comma, but joy comes in the morning. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, comma, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. The enemy comes in like a flood, comma, but he lifts up a standard against him. The wages of sin is death, comma, but the gift of God is eternal life. Ha, ha, hey, we are killed all the day long, comma, but yet none of these things move us. We are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. One more observation is she had no idea that she was a part of God's plan. Some of you today, you sit here, and I say this with all kinds of kindness and respect, and I don't mean to demean anybody, but how many people do I run into? You know, I almost wrote a book one time. There was a movie, a sappy, goofy movie. I don't think I could watch it. It was called Sleepless in Seattle. And, uh, you know, maybe you watched it, and if you're a man and you watched it, you won't admit it. A sappy little romance. But I know, I wanted to write a book one time called, it's kind of like Sleepless in Seattle, but it's called Clueless in Richmond. we got so many people, you are oblivious. And as much as I love you and adore you, you're clueless. You absolutely think that the news and the circumstances and all the awful things that are going on gets the final say. And that somehow, somehow you're no longer a part of God's plan because things get bad doesn't mean you're not a part of His thought. I want to give you this text, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all. I want you to shout with me all. Listen. We didn't choose this. We don't like it. We don't deserve it. But this situation we are under falls under the category of all. It doesn't say, and we know that all things, well, except COVID-19. And we know that all things except for politics. And we know that all things except for theories. And we know that all things except for the sickness. We know that all things except for the economy. We know all things except for the wall, uh, uh, stock market plummeting. No, it all means all. And somehow we got to get our mind wrapped around that God didn't bring this. This is of the devil. But even the things that the devil does against God's people, you ask Joseph. Come on, somebody. This young man did not deserve the plight he was given. He did not deserve the heartbreak, the, pair, uh, the pain he was under. He did not deserve to be victimized by his very, very own brothers. But the end of the story says, what you meant for bad, God turned around for good. I want to tell you something, that God's behind those closed doors. God's behind the scene, and God is working. And he's working all things out for our good. You better believe that. To those who are called God, people, according to his purpose. Write this down, everybody. Just because God has not revealed his plan to you yet doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan. He's got a plan. Hallelujah. And he's going to take care of everything. He's going to take care of everything. God had chosen to use her. She didn't know it yet. She needed a man of God to come by and tell her, Hey, hey, listen. Stop, put, put on pause for a minute your plan. And, and let me just tell you what the answer is going to be. And I come by to get you to the end of this story. Because everything changes when we get obedient to God's important word. Are you ready? So we know what's happened so far. Know about 
Elijah, we know about the widow. We know about her plan. We know that she didn't think to call on God. and She didn't deserve it. She was doing everything she could. She had a plan. And she had no clue whatsoever. She was clueless in Zarephath. She had no clue that God was about to use her in an incredible way. I want everybody to hear me. God is about to use you. He's going he's gonna to take what you're walking through. He's going to build a monument. He's going to build a trophy for your trophy case that you can give God the glory and make him famous for how he's brought you through. We have to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us in meekness and fear. There's a hope that resides in God's people. We are not hopeless. You may feel like quitting. You may want to quit because God dwells in you. You won't quit. Are you hearing me? You are going to persevere. You are going to prevail. You're going to be unmovable. You're going to abound in the work of the Lord and you're going to you're going to sit back and let God do his work in you and it may take longer and it in fact it is taking longer than we anticipated but the reality is God is working a plan for us and I'm going to prophesy once again there's going to be a day when you're going to there's going to be a day when you walk in this church and you get on this parking lot and you won't have a place to park there's going to be a day that every classroom every bus every seat every room will be filled our youth will be maxed out our children will be maxed out our choir will be maxed out everyone will be filled to capacity because God will not let the devil have the last word I wish somebody would praise him with me in this house hallelujah hey the end of the story Begins at 1 Kings 17 and 13. Elijah <clears throat> said unto her, Fear not. Everybody read my lips. Fear not. Fear not. And go and do as thou hast said. Oh, but. <laughs> Make me thereof a little cake first and bring it to me. What was the order in which he was to get the cake? And bring it to me and after for you and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. And I'm going to repeat this today. I come by as a man of God, as your man of God, to tell you it's time to hear the word of the Lord. The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain again upon the earth. And so, everybody circle verse 15, it hinges on this. And so she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she, and he, and her, and her house did eat many days. Eh, wow. And the barrel of meal never wasted, and the cruise of oil did not fail according to the word of God, which he had spoken by Elisha. I said all that to tell you there is a word for you. In your time of desperation. You may not feel particularly desperate now. But there was a time in your past you did. And there may be another time that someone will come. A situation will present itself. And you will feel that awful, horrible, dark feeling of hopelessness. And despair and desperation. I come to announce today. That there is a word that will cure all. There is a word that will fix every problem. There is a word that will help you in your time of difficulty and need. There is a word that will come to your rescue. Are you ready for that word? There is a word that is your salvation. And the word is first. But seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. It will be health to your flesh, 
when you bring the first fruits to the Lord. Abel and Cain brought an offering. God despised one and hated the other. Why? Because one brought the first fruits. Now here's what first means. First means ahead of everything else. First means ahead or before everything else. That's what first means. First means that it does not take a back seat to anyone. First doesn't mean it plays second fiddle. And I've got news for you. Some of you will continue to struggle. You will continue to feel desperate. You will continue the heartbreak. Up until the day you put God really, totally first in your life. The tithe says he's first. Our time says he's first. We don't do those things. If we don't put him first in our finances, we don't put him first in our time, everything else is just talk. We just spill out these lies. Oh, he's first. You know he's not. He knows he's not. So the desperate word of the Lord came to John and writes in Revelation 2, 4, I have something against you. You've left your first love. It seemed quite audacious to me. Here's the man of God. He's looking at this broke down, starving to death little woman. He's hearing the despair and heartbreak in her story. She did not choose to live in an area where there was famine for three and a half. She didn't deserve it. She had come up with this, what she thought was the best possible scenario. I got one option left, she said. I got a little bitty meal, a little bitty oil, some ingredients, and I'm going to make what's left and manage a little cake. And then wasn't bad enough that I'm a widow. I have no husband. I got this child, and I love him more than anything in this world. There are 10 little individuals walking this planet. And I know, I know that your grandkids are cute. But I'm just, I'm sorry to deliver the truth. My grandkids are the cutest things in the history of all creation. And we love them, Nana and Papa, more than life itself. I would die for them in a heart. I never dreamed I could love anything so much. And they're not even rotten. Can I imagine cooking one of them and eating them. I mean, calling Grant into the tent. There's a boy in the pot. No, I couldn't call Grant. He got no meat at all. If <laughs> I'd go for Brent. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but can you imagine taking your child, taking your kids, and saying, this is it. This is it. Got a little bit of cake left. Dad has tried everything. Mom has tried everything. And I'm sorry. But when we eat this cake, it'll be the last thing that goes into our bellies on this earth. And then to hear the man of God say, Give me the first cake. 
there's a lesson here. It's called, Who's First? And some of you are going to continue tormented and heartbroken and vexed until the day you get off the throne. You quit trying to be your your own Lord and Master and say, Lord, here, I'm sorry. I advocate the throne. It's yours. I've never meant to be the king of my life, and I've been putting myself first. Oh, this one's preaching. I've been putting myself first, and I'm sorry. I want to give you a statement. I want you to hear me. I cannot control these circumstances, but I can't control my priorities. I know you're waiting on Pastor to get his magic pastoral wand out and just fix everything. Because I've watched some of you come to my office and you looked at their drawer thinking, that's where he keeps that magic pastoral wand right there. And in five minutes, he's going to wave that and I'm going to walk out and I'm going to be completely awesome. There's no such animal. I can't control these circumstances, but I can control my priorities. And listen to me. Here's the word the Lord gave me. While we are waiting on God to change this situation, are we not? God is waiting on the situation to change us. Some of us hold the key. By the time you really put him first, you're going to see a break. It's going to be a breakthrough. Something's about to happen give you three words if you'll stand with me here's God's word for your desperate situation first means first first means first for all of you that watch us on Facebook live thank you we're gonna say our goodbye to you today talk to you next week we love you